travelers, this is the Baseball Time Machine. Our next journey takes us to the late 1990s, a time of relations, the founding of Google, Celine Dion, and the arrival of a young ball player from the Dominican Republic named Adrian. Adrian Beltre had a quietly fruitful 21-year MLB career, and is often most remembered for his wacky on-the-field antics. But taking a look back at his time in baseball, Adrian Beltre might have been better than we all remember. There's a chance he might be the greatest third baseman of all time. Adrian's story is one of disappointment, resilience, and finding your inner child. How does it all unfold? Let's step into the portal and find out. The tale of Adrian Beltre, the ball player, began at a very young age. His father, Bienvenido, was a professional player in the Dominican Republic and very good friends with baseball journeyman Felipe Alou. Felipe had a fulfilling 17-year MLB playing career as well as a 14-year managing career. With someone as knowledgeable as Felipe Alou mentoring Adrian, he was able to learn plenty at an early age. By age 12, he knew he wanted to be a third baseman after watching Ken Caminiti play an elite hot corner for the Houston Astros. Seeing the hard work Caminiti put in made Adrian get serious about baseball. A few years later, in 1994, Beltre joined the Los Angeles Dodgers pioneering workout facility in the Dominican Republic. At only 15 years old, Adrian was ahead of the game. So far ahead of the game that the Dodgers knew they had to make sure they wouldn't lose him. Per Major League Baseball rules, the minimum age that a player can be signed is 16 years old. LA pulled a fast one, signing 15-year-old Adrian Beltre for $23,000. They forged documents recording his birth year as 1978, rather than the actual birth year of 1979. Beltre flew through the minor leagues, always leaps and bounds above those his age. In 1996, he was the youngest player in the Class A South Atlantic League. He hit 307 with the Savannah Sand Nats and was promptly named the league's best prospect. He would be promoted to high A before the season's end. In 1997, he led the high A Florida State League in several offensive categories and was named FSL MVP. Baseball America, one of the most respected baseball publications, had tremendous praise for Beltre, remarking that he'd been just about perfect in his first two seasons within the Dodgers organization. Adrian entered the 1998 season as Baseball America's number three ranked MLB prospect. The difference between Beltre and the two in front of him were that he was three years younger than both of them. After continuing to slaughter minor league pitching, Adrian got the call to Chavez Ravine, joining a group that many referred to as baseball's most dysfunctional family. This team was nothing like the Dodgers we know today. LA had fired their manager and general manager just three days before calling up Beltre. Star catcher Mike Piazza had been traded across the country to the Marlins a month prior. One of the main reasons that Adrian got the call to the bigs was because Bobby Bonilla, one of the main pieces in the Piazza trade, had suffered an intestinal infection and had to go on the disabled list. This opened up the hot corner for Beltre. Interim general manager Tommy Lasorda instilled confidence in the 19-year-old youngster making it clear that Adrian deserved to be a Major League ball player. He became the youngest player to start at third base for the Dodgers since Tommy Brown in 1947. He wasn't outstanding during his rookie campaign, but managed to remain on the big league roster for the remainder of the season. That offseason, the Dodgers shipped Bonilla off to Queens, officially bestowing the starting third base position upon Adrian. Adrian would play 1999 with no troubles, improving in almost every offensive category across the board. But as soon as spring training rolled around, old controversy reared its ugly head. Beltre finally caught wind of the incorrect age listed on his documents. Adrian let his agent, Scott Boris, know that he was 19 and not the listed age of 20. Boris tried to keep things quiet, but not without a little bit of blackmail. He told the Dodgers that he would drop the matter and not seek legal action for Major League Baseball if the club compensated him and Adrian. LA wasn't going to let Boris take advantage of them, so they refused. After an investigation, Commissioner Bud Selig ruled that despite Beltre denying his knowledge of the incorrect birth date, he knew it had been altered. As a result, Beltre was ordered to stay on the Dodgers, but was awarded $48,000 for damages. The Dodgers were fined $50,000 and had their Campo Las Palmas complex shut down for one year. Scouts Ralph Avila and Pedro Piguero were also suspended. He improved in his second full season, batting 290 and hitting 20 bombs in 138 games. Still only 22 years old, Belcher was fully prepared to take an even bigger step forward in 2001. Unfortunately, he ran into a life-threatening roadblock. That winter, Adrian suffered a botched appendectomy back home in the Dominican Republic. This caused an infection that required additional surgery, holding him out of baseball activities for months. From the effects of the surgery, he lost 15 pounds and had to be attached to an IV until almost March. As spring training rolled around, Beltre flew to Vero Beach to join the team and struggled through what would be a slow recovery. He made his season debut in May and was never really able to hit his stride. Whether it was due to the infection or not, Adrian just couldn't gain any momentum over the next two seasons. 
His average was down again in 2002 and dropped to a career low of 240 in 2003. Negativity from fans and critics began to increase. Many in the baseball world started to question how good of a ball player Adrian Beltre actually was. The LA Times referred to Beltre as a 5 o'clock hitter, saying he was unable to translate his hitting ability from batting practice into games. With 2004 being a contract year, rumors spread like wildfire. Reports swirled around before the season that Adrian could have been dealt to the New York Yankees to replace the injured Aaron Boone, but we know how that story ended. To that point, Adrian had been known to start seasons hot and then slow down in May and June. But in 2004, he never took his foot off the gas. He hit 353 in the first month of the season and wouldn't hit under 283 in a month all year. He had the strongest first half of his career thus far, slugging 22 homers, one off his career high. Unfortunately, he was snubbed from All-Star voting, with the National League hot corner being represented by Mike Lowell and Scott Rowland. Although they both had a strong first half, there's definitely a case that Adrian should have made the team. Instead of being bitter about the snub, he simply used it as motivation. Everything really clicked in the second half. Numbers skyrocketed across the board. He would finish 2004 with career highs in multiple categories and even led Major League Baseball in home runs. Beltre's personal success rubbed off on the team as they went 93-69 and to clinch the NL West, ending an eight-season playoff drought, the franchise's longest since the early 1970s. In Adrian's first taste of the postseason, he hit 267 in the NLDS as the Dodgers fell to the eventual National League champion St. Louis Cardinals in four games. And like his team, Beltre fell short in his quest for the NL MVP. The award went to the only player with a higher war, Barry Bonds. The following year, Adrian reflected on his shortcoming. He flashed back to months prior and recalled the MVP chance that Dodger Faithful reigned upon him. He said he'd take that over an award any day. But there wouldn't be any more special experiences with Dodger fans. Adrian had become a free agent for the first time in his career. He decided to take his talents up north to Safeco Field, signing a five-year, $64 million deal with the Seattle Mariners. This signing took the league by surprise, as Seattle wasn't known for being a major player in free agency. Luckily for the M's, they used recent success to their advantage, as they had won 91-plus games the previous four seasons. But their luck ran out almost immediately. Beltre sank back into obscurity. He spent five seasons in Seattle, and they missed the postseason every year. In his first season with his new team, Adrian hit 255, his lowest average since his rookie year. One thing that never faltered through his time with the Mariners was his defense. It remained stellar, among the best in baseball. Over five years in Seattle, Adrian led the team in defensive runs saved by over 40. His best season with the M's came in 2007, as he slugged 26 homers and drove in 99 runs. He was awarded his first Gold Glove Award, which many thought to be long overdue. This also happened to be the team's only winning season with Beltre, as they went 88-74, and falling six games short of the AOS title. 2008 was another wash for Seattle, but Beltre had a historic season defensively winning his second consecutive Gold Glove and posting a 3.1 D-War, the third highest total among third basemen in the 2000s. To go along with the special defensive showing, he also hit 25 homers. He played some of the best baseball of his career in a contract year back in 04, which landed him the lucrative deal that took him through the 09 season with Seattle. But this time around, Adrian wasn't so fortunate. He was only batting 259 with five long balls in 73 games when he had to undergo surgery to remove a bone spur from his non-throwing shoulder. It was said that he would miss eight weeks, but returned in just under five, and caught fire from there. He hit 390 over the next nine games back from the DL, but had to go right back on after a ground ball took a bad hop and caught him in the old meat and two veg. The ruptured testicle cost him almost another month of his season. By the time he returned in September, the M's were pretty much out of the playoff hunt. The 2009 season was an injury-filled disaster for Beltre. He only played in 111 games, batted 265, and hit a career low eight home runs. His average numbers during his five-year stint in Seattle were solid, but nowhere near what the Mariners expected when they signed him. Safeco Field's spacious dimensions could have been partially to blame. After the nightmare that was the 2009 season, Beltre declined the M's arbitration offer and would test free agency. It didn't pay off immediately, but at the beginning of January, the Boston Red Sox would take a chance on Adrian, signing him to a one-year, $9 million contract. This was the true definition of a prove-it deal. Expectations were low, with Beltre coming off of an injury-riddled year and poor career numbers in Fenway and at the other AL East ballparks. Something had changed mentally within Adrian. This wasn't going to be the same guy we saw in Seattle. 2010 was a career resurgence if there ever was one. He had his best season since 2004, batting well over 300 and driving in over 100 runs. Thanks to the Green Monster and Fenway's much friendlier dimensions, 
Beltre hit an AL leading 49 doubles, a career high. The Red Sox missed the playoffs by six games, but Beltre was finally named to his first All-Star team, won his second Silver Slugger award, and finished ninth in MVP voting. Now about to enter his age 31 season, Adrian had completely transformed how the league viewed him. He cashed in on the new perspective, inking a six-year, $96 million contract with the Texas Rangers. The Rangers were coming off their first World Series appearance in franchise history and hoped that Beltre's veteran presence could put them over the top. In 2011, he started in the All-Star game for the first time, but went on the DL with a strained hamstring only 10 days later. After being on the shelf for six weeks, Beltre returned in September and burst into flames offensively, hitting 12 bombs in his first 15 games back. Here in September Player of the Month, feeling Texas to a 19-6 final 25 games, clinching the AL West. Their 96 wins was a new franchise record. It was another stellar season for Adrian Beltre, as he hit 296 with over 30 home runs and over 100 RBI once again. His fantastic defense earned him a platinum glove, the first of two that he would win in his career. In his second trip to the postseason, Beltre came up big on several occasions. In Game 4 of the ALDS against Tampa Bay, Beltre carried the Rangers on his back, crushing three solo shots to win 4-3 and advance to the ALCS. He became the seventh player in MLB history to hit three homers in a postseason game, and the first to do it in a game that their team won by a single run. He only hit 222 in the ALCS, but had a key RBI single off Max Scherzer to give Texas the lead in what would be the deciding Game 6. The Rangers took down the Tigers and would meet the St. Louis Cardinals in the 107th edition of the World Series. This series would turn out to be a seven-game classic. Beltre hit safely in five of the first six games, including a big round tripper off Chris Carpenter in Game 5, but went 0-3 for 3 in Game 7 as the Cardinals were crowned World Series champions. This was the closest Beltre would get to being a champion, and despite taking the loss pretty hard, his play never faltered. The Rangers and Beltre bounced back with another strong season. Adrian was voted as an all-star starter again, and along with teammate Josh Hamilton, had one of the best offensive seasons in the American League. Texas finished with 93 wins, just one behind the AL West champion Oakland A's, but good enough to gain entry into the wildcard game. In the wildcard game, they take on the Baltimore Orioles. The O's had gone from 93 losses the year prior to 93 wins in 2012, and were carrying a ton of momentum into their first playoff appearance since 1997. The Rangers offense went silent, Beltre included, as they suffered a 5-1 loss, ending their season. Beltre's signing in Texas helped him become a household name, as joining one of the best teams in baseball put him back in the spotlight. His quirky personality began to get noticed more and more, causing him to go viral on social media all the time. Adrian's big brother-little brother relationship with teammate Elvis Andrews never failed to entertain the masses. Beltre was able to tell stories with simple facial expressions. You always knew how he was feeling out in the field. Even at the plate, he became known for his violent swings. Down to one knee, helmet off. His swings would be humbling on a miss, but electrify the crowd if he really got a hold of one. I think now would be a good time to go over some of Adrian Beltre's wackiest moments. In 2016, Adrian slid in the second with a double and had some fun with Brewers' Orlando Arcia, switching his hands back and forth while Arcia tried to tag. Beltre got himself into a pickle against the Astros, and instead of taking a tag from Jose Altuve, aborted the mission and took off towards the pitcher's mound. Felix Hernandez and Adrian Belche became best pals in Seattle and had plenty of run-ins together once they became AL West foes. There were few more entertaining matchups than King Felix versus El Coja. In the eighth inning of a blowout game against the Marlins, Belche was on deck and wanted to get a better view of Drew Steckenrider pitching. He was away from the on-deck circle and a little too close to being behind the plate, so umpire Jerry Davis told him to move back over. Rather than taking a few steps back, Adrian brought the on-deck circle to him, dragging it over to where he was standing. He was promptly ejected for the action, causing himself and manager Jeff Bannister to argue the tossing. Beltre insisted that he wasn't trying to be funny and was just doing what was told. And of course, the many, many times that fellow ballplayers tried to touch his head. In 2012, he opened up about his biggest pet peeve, noting that he doesn't like when anyone touches his head, not even members of his family. These may be things that present folk remember Adrian Beltre most for, but he gave so much more to the game. He continued to be a face of consistency, averaging 25 homers, 89 RBI, and a 307 average from 2013 through 2016. He laid all third baseman in average and hits during that period. In 2014, he made his fourth and final All-Star appearance and won his fourth Silver Slugger Award. On May 15, 2015, Adrian became the fifth third baseman in MLB history to hit 400 home runs. Later that year, he hit for his third career cycle. It was the first time in 82 years that someone had hit for three cycles in their career. Interestingly enough, the feat has already been done twice since. 
Funny how baseball works sometimes. In 2016, Beltre led all third basemen in defensive runs saved, earning him his fifth gold glove. He continued to receive MVP votes, finishing top 10 in four of the last five seasons. The Rangers kept playing well, but fell short in the 2015 and 16 postseasons. Adrian's above average play earned him a two year, $36 million extension through 2018. Entering 2017, the league was on Beltre Milestone Watch. Only 55 hits away from 3,000, history was bound to be made. July was a special month. On the 4th, he became only the 17th player in MLB history to hit 600 doubles. Three days later, he became the 21st player in MLB history to amass 2,500 total bases. And then, the big one. On July 30th, in front of the home crowd, Adrian Beltre laced a double down the left field line to become the 31st player in MLB history and first Dominican-born player to reach 3,000 hits. Although he only played 94 games in 2017, it was a year full of unforgettable moments. Both the Rangers and Beltre regressed in 2018. Adrian's average dropped below 300 for only the second time since signing with Texas. His 15 big flies were his lowest season total with the ball club. The team fell to 67-95, their worst record in four years. After his 21st season, 39-year-old Adrian Beltre announced his retirement from baseball. He left his mark on the game, leaving his name in the record books as well as the hearts of fans everywhere. His 1,707 RBIs, 5,309 total bases, 1,151 extra base hits, 636 doubles, and 3,166 hits remain major league records for a third baseman. Hall of Famers Mike Schmidt and Eddie Matthews are the only third baseman to produce more war and hit more long balls than Beltre. Brooks Robinson, a man many claim to be the greatest defender in baseball history, is the only player to appear in more games and participate in more double plays at the hot corner. Defensive runs saved became a statistic in 2003 and is a defensive metric that many baseball fans consider when determining elite fielders. Adrian Beltre leads all third basemen in defensive runs saved and is currently second among all players, only trailing the defensively sound Angelton Simmons. If the eye test wasn't good enough to prove how gifted Beltre was as a player, the numbers will tell you everything you need to know. Adrian's 2004 season remains one of the most impressive seasons from a third baseman in baseball history. The difference between these other players' seasons and Beltre's is that he wasn't yet an established star. His magical 04 came almost out of nowhere. He was previously known as a young phenom turned underachiever. It also only came two years after the Balco scandal, so many fans doubted that a season of that caliber could be done clean, but indeed it was. Adrian missed out on the NL MVP that year to Barry Bonds, who had one of the weirdest seasons ever statistically. His 232 walks and 120 intentional walks were MLB records, basically breaking the game. If you compare the two defensively, a case could be made that Beltre's season was just as good. Despite not joining the Rangers until he was 31 years old, he became one of the greatest and most popular players ever to don the red, white, and blue. He accumulated 41.1 war in Texas, third in franchise history. On June 8, 2019, Texas retired Beltre's number 29. In 2022, he was inducted into the Rangers Hall of Fame. In 2024, he'll be eligible for the National Baseball Hall of Fame. There's little doubt that he'll find his way into Cooperstown before we know it. Adrian Beltre was a one-of-a-kind ball player, the perfect mix of personality and pristine playing ability. Full of heart and delightful quirkiness, there were few more fun to watch. His transformation from fluke to star is admirable to say the least. He never stopped working hard, overcame several injuries, and even bet on himself to succeed. Personalities like Adrian Beltre are great for baseball. Players like him show everyone that not only can you be a damn good ball player, but you can have a lot of fun doing it. And that's what baseball's all about. This has been the Baseball Time Machine. Thanks for traveling.